wow. I'm telling you, it is a thrill to be here with you, and I just believe heaven's going to open up, and God's going to just hit you and zap you right where you are. You know, I, like, I don't know about you, but I like to be zapped by the Holy Ghost. I like the Holy Ghost. Look at somebody and smile real big and say, Holy Ghost. You know, it's all right to say Holy Spirit. I say Holy Spirit all the time because it, He is holy and He is a spirit, but I just like to say Holy Ghost. There's something about the Holy Ghost. It just makes you feel good. Amen? Amen. Wow. Well, it's, it, uh, I, I'm telling you, I could just get started right away with you guys. Y'all are, y'all are ready. But I, I just want to say thanks to um, Pastor Mark for inviting us here. He told me he was going to be away. And my goodness, these reports that I just heard this morning just made me want to jump on the plane and go too, you know. I'm saying, my Lord, all of that happening. But you know, that's the way it's supposed to happen. When you're anointed of God, you're called of God. And let me say something to you. Always be glad to let your pastor go and minister like this. Don't ever, don't ever have any reservations at all about sharing your pastor with people in other parts of the world or the United States or wherever it may be because when, when you release your pastor, you're opening the door for God to just bring things into your life that you need. And so always hold their hands up too while they're away like this. I mean, pray for them while they're here. You definitely want to do that, but when they do, kind of double up. Just kind of double up and say, God, just put more angels out there and protect them and bless them and just fight off the demon spirits that come against those meetings in any way whatsoever and just let people find Jesus and know him as Lord and Savior. Because this is what it's all about, is bringing people to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Pastor Mark is one of those guys, you know, that just gets up in the morning, puts his breeches on and says, I'm going to go for God today. Amen. Amen. I like, I like people like that. I'm telling you. And so this is our first time here in your church. And I'm telling you, I, I'm just so glad to be here. And it was so nice to be with Daniel and Amy last night, you know. And, you know, my wife and I kind of mature. We've been around a little bit. And uh, they came to take us to, to uh, dinner last night. And I saw this beautiful young couple. I thought, my goodness, what are those young people like that want to hang around with us mature people like us? <laughs> But, uh, you know, we had a wonderful time last night, and I'm just grateful that we can uh, meet new people. It just happens all the time. We just keep finding new people in the body of Christ, and then we go find people that's not yet in the body of Christ and help get them in the body of Christ. And then to come and meet this morning, uh, Pastor Geneva, and just be a part of this, this church and this family, and I believe you must be a son. You, uh, son, I'm telling you, it's good to have the family involved in the ministry. I know in our, our family, our, uh, in our church and ministry, our family's all involved. And so we just all work together. And so when we're home together or wherever we are, we just, we just love God all the time. Amen? Amen? And I'm telling you, God, I believe, has got something good for you today. Now, I hope you brought your blankets and your, your pillows because we're just going to stay here all day. They said we've got a 6 o'clock service. So what's the point in going out after the service today? We just might as well just take a little nap right here after a while. I mean, when the Holy Ghost zaps us like that, just pull out your pillow and lay down a little while, and then I'll come by and just slap you with the Holy Ghost again and just... Just believe you have another dose. I just like taking dose of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, if this is your first time here, I'm not crazy. Uh, uh, I'm just full of the Holy Ghost and just love Jesus with all of my heart. Amen. And this is my lovely bride over here, 51 years. But my wife, was my wife Sharon. Fifty-one years we've been married in this past March, and uh, we just keep going on for God and just doing what He tells us to do. And God gave us four wonderful children, and one of them had to go on to heaven early at 15. But, you know, we're just th thankful for God. We had 15 years with Him, and uh, we got the rest, and then we got five grandchildren. And now we just had this one spring up, this great-grandchild that just takes the cake. I mean, she just... I mean, you know, you think you've had it all, but all at once this great-grandchild comes in, and man, 
where did this happen? You know, it's just like <laughs> life is, it never stops, you know, and the family just keeps going. So I'm telling you, I, I'm excited today about Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> oh, I, I think I'll tell you about something. We did bring a little bit of our stuff, not much, because uh, we, we were coming to uh, Newport Beach anyway, and we had to be here. And so that's when Pastor Mark said, if you're going to be here, we'll just come on down. And so we just drove down or up. I, when I'm out in California, I never know which is which. You know, I never know which is north or south. You drive by the water, and I just get confused, even though I'm a pilot. You know, and you think a pilot ought to know his directions. But anyway... Uh, Sometimes I just get confused, but I think this was south that we came from uh, Newport Beach. But anyway, it's good to be here in San Diego, San Diego again. We used to come here all the time, and I'll tell you, it's just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, we're from Dallas, Texas, and, you know, it just gets so hot there. We have concrete and buildings in, in Dallas and heat, but... Uh, Come out here and it's absolutely, you got the ocean, you got the trees, you got the mountain, you just got it all, and, uh, and lovely people. <laughs> Amen. This is a book that I wrote some time ago, and it's about how that many times people have been a victim somewhere, some way, somehow. And God does not want you to be a victim. You don't have to be a victim, you can be a victor. And I really, really encourage people that's had anything happen in their life that has been a stumbling block, a hurt, or a pain of any kind to get this on your way out. And then again, this is a very special book. I wrote this book. I was doing a Bible school, and in the Bible school, we had, um, it was done by uh, uh, satellite, and we had 15,000 students in this Bible class that I was speaking and I had to write a book, and so I wrote this book, Spiritual Growth. And it is so simple. I mean, it is absolutely so simple. Uh, it talks about the natural man, the carnal man, the spiritual man. Renew your minds, the power of your words, forgiveness, walk. I mean, it's so simple. But um, after it was over, I was in uh, Brooklyn, New York, speaking in a large church there. And uh, they were having three services in the morning because the church had grown so. And uh, between one of the services, the pastor's wife said, I heard you were going to retire this book. I said, well, I'm considering it. And uh, she said, well, if you're going to retire it, can I have the rights to it? And I said, why? She said, well, our choir has to read this book every three months and give a report on it every three months. I said, really? She said, yes. And their choir just had 300 people in the choir. And... Uh, so I thought, well, I don't know. I'll let you know. So we flew back to Dallas, and uh, we had to take a little driving trip from Dallas to uh, Little Rock. And I asked my wife, I said, would you, would you drive and let me read my book? And she said, yes. And so I was reading my book, and I said, Sharon, this is a good book. <laughs> I said, I didn't know I said all of that. And so I went back and, and touched it up a little bit and, and, and just didn't change a lot, but I touched it up just a little bit. And, of course, the publishers called me, and then there's a little guy trying to get started over in Columbus, Ohio, that needs some exposure in his ministry. And so he said, I hear you're redoing your book, Spiritual Growth. And um, anyway, I said, yes, I am, just a little bit. He said, well, I'd like to do the forward for you. And his name's Rod Parsley. And so he needed a little exposure, and so I thought I'd give him some. So he said, I want to do the forward for you. So anyway, maybe this will help him get his name out there a little bit by being on my book. And so anyway, to make a long story short, that church in Brooklyn, New York, now has ordered 30,000 of these books. And now it's gone around the world, and it's about... I don't know how many languages now, and it's over a million copies, and this book is just keeps going. It's like that Energizer bunny, you know. When I thought it was done, that was just the beginning, and now it just keeps going, and we just now just got it translated into the Hungarian language. Uh, uh, 
it's amazing. Every year it seems like some other country picks it up and then they make connections. And it's a great book, and especially if you know anybody just getting started. I mean, you don't have to be just getting started. This is a good book for spiritual growth because we all need to be reminded of a lot of things as we go along. Amen? So this will be a, a, a blessing to you. And this one, I was preaching a message, and it's called Expect right and wrong expectations in friendships. I call it relationships. The publisher wanted to call it friendships. And I said, okay, you can use the word friendships instead of relationships. And um, <clears throat> anyway, I was preaching on this and a lady by the name of Joyce Meyer heard me preach it. And she said, Don, if you don't write a book on that, I am. So I hurried up because she's just written 99 books, and so I knew she could do it much quicker than I could. So I got my pen out and, well, actually my typewriter or my computer or whatever. And, and so this book talks about relationships, and I think it's one of the biggest problems in relationships today is the expectations that we put on others. And anyway, she needed exposure too. And so she said, can I write the foreword for your book? I need a little exposure. And I know you sell so many books, so uh, if you'll let me put my name on your book, maybe that'll help me a little bit. Now, you know I'm just kidding you. And, uh, but anyway, she did want and ask me to do the foreword. It doesn't make the book any better or anything like that because her name's on the book. But uh, these three books are... Just a few of the many, many things we have that we just kind of stuck together and brought along. And my lovely wife will be out there at the table. You can do a check, cash, or credit card, either one. And this one, I believe, is $10. And this one is $15. And this one is $16. And all three for $30. So it's a $41 value, she said. And you can get them all three for $30. Is anybody like this one on right and wrong expectations? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, you do. It's good to be up close. <laughs> what about this victim book? Anybody want this victim? Well, I'll give you the spiritual growth. Thank you. Now, I got that done and uh, got all the marketing out of the way, and now we can talk about something else real good. Amen. Are you blessed today? Yes. Now, they told me, I, I'm seriously, they told me just take my time I had all day long. So, uh, of course, in Dallas, they won't let me take all day long, so uh, I'll respect you enough that I won't be all day long, but I don't know how long the Holy Ghost will be. Is that all right? Isn't God good? You know, I just feel so good being here. I believe God is going to do something in your life today. Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your goodness, for your mercies that are new every morning, and I pray, Holy Spirit, today that you'll open the windows of heaven in this room, touch every mind, touch every heart, touch every individual. And I pray that your anointing will flow through my lips today, and that you'll bring uh, the, the things to my heart and my mind that you want me to talk about today. And I pray, Lord, when we leave this room, any wound, any hurt that anyone has today will be healed and made whole. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, today I, I really prayed about what I would be talking to you about. And one of the things that I want to probably mention starting out is God wants you to thrive, not survive. I see so many Christians today in survival mode when that's not God's plan for us at all. God doesn't want us being in a survival mode, but he wants us to be in a thriving mode. And I, I, I look and see so many believers that are living their life below their privileges and below the place that God has called them to be. And I'd like to read a scripture today it's found in Psalms 92, verse 12 and 13. Psalms 92, verse 12 and 13. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. Well, you got a lot of palm trees out here, so you kind of know what I'm talking about when I read this verse of Scripture. And when you see those big, beautiful palm trees, you know, I don't know about you, but I love palm trees. If I had my will and God would let me, I'd either live in California or Florida, one or the other, because I just, I just like to 
kind of hang on close to a palm tree. I just love them. They're just beautiful. They're not as, they're not as pretty as those mesquite trees in Texas. You know, mesquite trees are really ugly, uh, but the palm trees are beautiful. So he said, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. They shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. I believe that God wants you to flourish, not just get by, not struggle. And how many, how many of the church people today know God, they know all about His Word, but yet somehow have not been able to practice in their life and walk by faith the way they know they could? Limitations and setbacks, it's a real fact in your life. I mean, it's just going to be that way, that they come. But when limitations and setbacks come, and I call them unscheduled events, when unscheduled events come in your life, that many people panic. They don't know what to do. They don't know which way to turn. But see, that's where you have the power of God on the inside of you. So that when the unscheduled events come, you've got God's word on the inside of you. Instead of panicking and getting in fear and saying, I don't know what to do. That's the time that you just take the word of God on the inside of you. And whatever the unscheduled event is, you just begin to talk to that thing about the end results, not about the present situation. You know, I remember one time I was landing in my, our, our airplane when we were coming into Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, I was coming in on an instrument approach. I needed fuel, and I had to make a fuel stop. And uh, I was flying from um, uh, San Antonio, Texas to uh, Philadelphia, but I had to make a fuel stop in Nashville. And uh, I was flying a twin-engine airplane and uh, turboprop. No, it was a, this one was a, not a turboprop, it was a gas engine. But anyways, I was coming in on an instrument landing, and of course, I couldn't see. But when you got down to decision height, which was 200 feet, you had to decide if you were going to go around or uh, going to cheat just a little bit and go a little bit lower. But you don't want to cheat. So we got down to about 200 feet, and uh, I covered my windshield, and I couldn't see the runway. So... When this happened, I didn't have a choice but to go around, so I, I did the necessary things to make my airplane go around. I didn't contact the tower exactly then, but I started around, and when I give it power, I lost the right engine. And uh, <clears throat> that wasn't a good feeling, you know, when you're uh, needing fuel. I mean, I had 45, a little more than 45 minutes of fuel left, but it's still, at the same time, it's not a good feeling to be able not to see the runway and have one engine. Somebody says, well, I thought one engine's good. It is if you know what you're doing. See, if you don't know what you're doing and you're flying a twin-engine uh, airplane, and there's what you call BMC, Velocity Minimum Control. So if you're not doing the right thing with your airplane, that one engine will flip you upside down. So uh, I had been trained to know what to do when you lose an engine. And so I, I wasn't expecting to lose it. I needed altitude to get back up, to go around. And so I knew I would follow the directions of the tower once I, I contacted them to let them know I was going around. And just about the time I was ready to, to contact them so to say I was going to go around again because it was missed approach, I lost that engine. Well, you know what? I couldn't turn around and look at my passengers and say, what did I do now? <laughs> <laughs> See, how many times are you caught in a situation? God doesn't want you to just thrive. I mean, he didn't want you to just survive. He wants you to thrive. Well, you know what? I wasn't nervous. I wasn't fearful because I lost an engine and because I couldn't see the ground. I wasn't excited about it. <laughs> but I wasn't frightened. So I, I kept going and, and then I, when I got a speed that I was comfortable with at my airplane, then I contacted the tower and told them I had a missed approach and I said also I got a little problem going on here that I need you to bear with me on a moment. I may not answer you as quickly as you want. But uh, if you'll give me vectors, I want to make another approach. 
And so they begin to talk to me back and forth, and I was working with my airplane and trying to get the right engine started and, um, and follow the course they were giving me at the same time. And see, that's the way it is when you're walking by faith and unscheduled events come. You know, you've got the problem. You don't deny the problem. You don't just say, some, you don't just make some confession because you've heard that through teaching, but you have the problem. See, when the Bible says, call those things which be not as though they were, that means they're not. Some of these faith people, I don't understand that. You know, they just, they want to ignore or that, that there's a problem. They just want to go on. You see, call those things that are not. They're not. Now, I couldn't say I had two engines running. I didn't. When I talked, I had a little button on my, you know, and I, I touched the button and I said, I lost the right engine. What did I want to do? Was I going to call in and say, hey, everything's happy. Everything's great up here. You know, this is wonderful. <laughs> no, I said, I'm having a little difficulty here at the plane. I lost the right engine, but I'll get it together. It'll work. Just give me time because I've been trained. What if I hadn't been trained? It would have been a mess. Right? See, you've been trained. Every, every time pastor or whoever is here teaching you the word of God, that word is for you to learn the word of God and learn how to walk by faith. And when unscheduled events happen, you don't ignore the problem. There is a problem. But the thing of it is, you don't, you don't get the problem bigger by magnifying the problem and stretching the problem and making the problem bigger. But you start magnifying the king of kings. You magnify the Lord of lords. You begin to lift up praise. Lift up praise when I got a problem? Yes. You begin to magnify the Lord and begin to magnify Him and make Him bigger than the problem. Well, you see, when I was riding along in that, flying along in the airplane, I had a problem, but I didn't, wasn't worried. I wasn't fearful. I knew something would work out. Well, I, I, I flew around and, and uh, got vectors again and was coming in and the, and, but when I got a little more altitude, the temperature changed and the ice went off my windshield. But when I came back around to that same altitude again to come back on the runway, I got a, the ice back on my windshield. Well, I had to do another go around. And that wasn't exciting, but I had to go and do another one. Finally, uh, when I went around the second time, I got the engine going and that made me feel a lot more comfortable to have two engines working at the same time. But here it was, I'd come twice and couldn't see the runway. Again, am I gonna get fearful and ask somebody back there that didn't know what they're doing, come up here and help me? No. I've been trained, folks. You've got the word of God. Amen. And when the enemy starts trying to give you a licking, you just start giving him a kicking. <laughs> Amen? Amen. When he starts trying to just knock you down, you just realize, I'm an heir of God. I'm a joint heir of Jesus Christ. Greater is he that lives within me than he that's within the world. You said that's easy for you to say. You're up there. You're, everything's all right. Hold on, hold on. You don't know what I've been through. I didn't get here overnight. I've been doing this for 55 years. And the devil doesn't like what I do. But you know what? I don't care because he doesn't like it. I don't like what he does. <laughs> but greater is he that's within me yeah. than yeah. he that's within the world. Amen. Ooh, somebody grab hold of this today. <laughs> See, he said to call those things that are not as though they were. So he's saying they're not, but you want them to see them as they should be. Abraham had hope against hope. That's right. So you see, we, change, we don't deny the situation, we change the situation. I didn't deny I had an engine that didn't work. It wouldn't have done me any good. 
But you know what? I kept on until I got the engine going. Thank God. Now, what you have to do is when you get up every day is realize this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. David said in Psalms 34 and 1, he said, I will. It was a decision. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises will continually be in my mouth. Now, see, what, what I'm talking about, you don't whine and talk to everybody about the problems and you don't pray the problems, but you change the problem with the word of God that's in your heart and in your mouth. The anointing of God will come on you wherever you are. You don't have to be in church for the anointing of God to be on you. Amen? I mean, I've been in places and I've been so anointed with the Holy Ghost at times. Uh, I, I'm telling you, just in restaurants, I've had the power of God to just come on me. And so the anointing of God, the anointing of God with your faith will destroy any yoke of the devil. So whatever's going on in your life today, I want to give you some comfort. I want to add some value to your life today. I don't want to just come in and go out and say, we had some guest speaker from Texas. No, I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to build my name, but I want you to remember that the Holy Ghost helped you through a situation because that we came together. You know, God's not just a thing that we talk about, we read about. God is a spirit. He said, let there be light, and there was. Isn't that awesome? Awesome. And he's given us the privilege to know him. The Bible said that the earth was without form and void, but God said, let there be light. Mm -hmm. And he went on down all the things that he did, and finally he said, I'm going to do something else. He was making all of, the, all of the things. He was the day and the night, the stars, the moon, the mountains, and dividing the oceans and the rivers and the waters and put all of the vegetation and everything that he did and made a beautiful earth. Well, you know what? God wasn't just kind of flying along by the seat of his pants and saying, wonder what I'll do the next time. God had a plan. And you know what the plan was? It was for man. He made the earth specifically for man to live in. So when you look at the earth, you need to just drive along and, and, and realize, God put this here for me. Yeah. God did this for me. God had me in mind when he made the earth. Did you know Psalms 39 says that God's thinking about you all the time? Amazing. God's thinking about you all the time. I don't know about you, but when I sometimes stop and think about some of these things, I just say, God, it is so awesome to be a a child of God, to know Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. And then finally, he, he got some dust and he formed the man, and he breathed himself into the dust. So when you look at yourself, even though Adam fell, God sent his son Jesus to redeem us and to restore us. So when you look at yourself and you're having a problem, just kind of go back a little bit and begin to meditate how you got here. I went through my mama and daddy. Oh, come on, don't put it that small. God knew about you before you were ever born. So when you have a problem, don't think I got this all by myself. You know, I was in my room last night and somebody that I made a mistake and given my number sent me 22 texts last night. And every text was this long. (laughs) And you know what it was? Talking about my problem. I sent two in the middle. They didn't even know I got them because I was too busy. In the problem. In the problem. So many people let unscheduled events cause them not even to be able to thrive. They can't thrive. They're not even surviving sometimes. But God wants us to thrive, not survive. You know, my third approach that I was going in, when I was going in this time, the 
I came back on my windshield again. I did have two engines this time. But I got down to decision height, and when I got down to decision height, the ice went off my windshield, and I saw the runway in front of me. And that was a really neat feeling. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you get the answer to your problem, it does help, doesn't it, when you get the answer. But remember, God's got the answer before it ever happens. So when you're in the problem, you got to think about, if this is just temporary. Jesus, when he was going to, to the cross, had the resurrection on his mind. He couldn't have endured if he hadn't had the resurrection on his mind. God said that you shall flourish in the house of the Lord. So that means that every day when we get up, no matter what comes, we can flourish because God somehow lives on the inside of us. And no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Because it's your heritage. It's your heritage to do that as a servant of the Lord. Hmm. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Ooh. You know, when you get knocked down, just be like Micah. I may, I may fall, but I will arise. Micah chapter 7, verse 8. I may fall, but I shall arise. I may fall, but I shall arise. So any day that you have an unscheduled event that comes in your life, don't get overcome by the unscheduled thing that happens, be overcome by the goodness of God. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, let me explain this to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, in the New Living Translation, it says it like this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed and broken. We are perplexed, but we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up and keep going. Isn't that good? We're pressed on every side. And I think the day and the hour where we live today with technology, you know what, I forgot to start my timer, so I really have to stay all day now. <laughs> so Pastor Geneva, I don't know what I'm going to do. I forgot to start my, should I start it now? <laughs> and all the other didn't count. That was just warm-up time. I'll just forget the timer. But today's technology... Today's technology has brought life to us in a different way than it was when I was a kid growing up. When I was a kid growing up, and we were first married, and we had children that we traveled in the car, uh, well, we was telling um, Amy and uh, Daniel last night that we had three children. We kind of didn't know how that was all happening, and we one day we got it all figured out, but four came anyway. Uh, but we were traveling, and we had two children traveling with us, and we really didn't have a home of our own. We just, wherever we landed, you know, and we was going from church to church, and, and uh, life was simple. Life was simple. We didn't have... Phones, you know, you just got to one destination, and sometimes even hotel rooms didn't have phones. Some of you young people are looking at me, whoo. <laughs> you know, our grandchildren don't know what it's like without cell phones, you know, or some of them don't. But, you know, it's just the generation that we live in is a now generation because of technology. But you know what? In the church, I think, technology has taken over in the church in a lot of places. And they have replaced technology for the power of the Holy Ghost. And folks, I, I really appreciate technology, you know. I, I really do. I'm glad that we got it. Sometimes I'm glad we got it. But when I grew up, we were married, and we were just having Holy Ghost meetings everywhere we went. 
We didn't have all of the, the video. You know, we're on television, on networks, and around different parts of the world. And I'm grateful for all of that. But sometimes I go into churches, and all the technology, I don't know. I don't know, and I, I hope I'm, I'm okay by, with you by saying this, but sometimes there's 20 screens up there, and sometimes more, and every screen almost is different, and they're worshiping, but I don't know what I'm expected to do. I don't know if I'm supposed to watch that screen, and watch this screen for a minute, and watch that screen for a minute, watch this screen for a minute, and watch this screen, or if I'm supposed to sing and watch. And I'm not critical. If you take this as being critical, you don't understand where I'm going. I'm just telling you, technology has changed life. Our life is forever changed, not by this particular uh, invention that I'm holding in my hand. It's a part of it. But technology in itself, and, and you know, I was in one church recently, and I was down on the front row, and all of the stuff coming out of the machines got up my nose, and, and, and I could hardly even sing a song, you know, because of the stuff coming out of the machines. But, you know, I say this to, to, to not belittle anybody, but technology doesn't replace the power of God. And technology, as I said, it puts us in now. No matter what's going on in Israel or wherever in the world, all you have to do is touch this little thing and you can find out what's going on in any part of the world. People are texting, people are... I mean, and every day a new, new something comes out. You know, you buy one and it's old and weak almost and, uh, because something else is happening. But the Holy Ghost never gets old. What worked 50 years ago in the Holy Ghost and the Word of God, it's still the same. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm the Lord God and I change not. The same saving power that saved the, 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 the people on, on, the, on the day of Pentecost, that same power is just the same. It never changed. See, some people, uh, they don't realize that in the N New Testament, when the Holy Ghost was poured out on the day of Pentecost and the power fell and those people spoke in tongues, they, some people say, well, that was 2,000 years ago and that was for those people. But that wasn't what Peter said. He said, this promise is to you and to your children and to them that are far off. Right. So my friends, I want to say today, don't let everything around you overcome you. You know, it's amazing today, and, and I'm probably a little bit guilty myself, but it's amazing wherever you go. We was in a restaurant in Newport Beach the other night, and um, we sat down to have our meal, and uh, four people were sitting at the table. I believe it was four people sitting at the table. They were all looking at this and not talking to each other. They're all touching and doing, you know, and... And what it's done, it is, it is, it hurt, it's hurt relationships. It's, it's, it's caused people not to communicate. You know, kids in their room get texts from their parents. It's time to come and eat. You know, I, you think I'm kidding, don't you? You think I'm kidding? It, it, it's happening all over, you know? Uh, I got grandchildren that won't answer their phone, but will answer a text. So I couldn't be too old. I had to start texting, you know, if I wanted to talk to my grandchildren. But seriously, when, when, we, when we understand that technology in many ways has even brought us more problems in some ways because it brings everything in the now. Now, we can't deny that technology is here. I'm not even trying that. I, I use technology everywhere I can. So I'm not, I'm not critical of it. But what's happened, it has made our world much different than it used to be. As I said, when we travel, it was very simple. And, and see, some of you young people now, you're not even going to know what I'm talking about. But they didn't have those kind of diapers that the kids have today. <laughs> When we traveled uh, back with our two kids, with the first two, when we, we traveled with them, and uh, it was not a pleasant thing to happen. But life was simple. But we'd come to a church, and we'd stop there at that church, and, and, and it, we may be scheduled for a week, but, you know, we may wind up being there six weeks because the Holy Ghost would just, just start moving but you know, our lives are so committed today, people 
sometimes even a church service is too much for them and too long. Now, the ball game's not too long, but you know, the church service, if it goes longer than 90 minutes, you know, then their butt starts getting all <laughs> numb and, you know, just, I mean, I'm telling you, but I, folks, we've got to come back to the foundation, to the rock. Upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So I think I've described pretty well and let you know my intentions, and I'm not against technology or anything like that, but we can't let it take our lives over. There should be one thing in our lives, and that's the Spirit of God. And our words should be the words of God. Our thoughts should be the thoughts of God. Amen. We're pressed on every side, the Bible says. But it doesn't mean because we're pressed that we... And, then, and the scripture says we get knocked down, but we get back up. Amen. Amen. We get knocked down, but we get back up. You know, um, you know I can follow my notes or I can preach. What do you want me to do? <laughs> well, you know, a number of years ago, I was um, preaching out of state... And my wife was home, and this was, we, we had had our uh, fourth child by this time. And uh, I was in another state, and she was home. And our, our daughter, we only have one daughter, and she was hit by a car. And the, the uh, accident threw her so far, almost 100 feet, and almost as high as the telephone wires. When she landed on the ground, I was not there, <clears throat> and, and at the time we had a huge St. Bernard dog, and uh, so when my wife heard the commotion, she thought it was the dog that had gotten hit by the car, because several of uh, my nieces and nephews were there, and they were playing, but they had, there was a field across the street, and they were coming back across, and of course my daughter didn't see the car, she darted out in front of it, and the car hit her, and so my wife didn't go out just at first, but... She, she finally got news that it was one of, our, one of the children, and then she found out it was our daughter. Well, it was severe. I mean, it was severe. <clears throat> and I was, I was just about to go on in my service, and um, when she called and she said this is, she, by this time she had gotten to the hospital, and she said the doctor said that Tammy's not going to live, and this is really really a bad thing that's happened. She said, you need to get home as soon as possible. Well, we started making arrangements to get me a flight to get home. And um, it was the wee hours of the morning, and I had a couple of stops to make. And of course, I called the hospital in between, because this was before cell phone time, and would get her to the phone. And when I walked into the hospital at... Uh, around 1.30, 2 in the morning, what I looked at was unbelievable. My daughter's head had just swelled, and she was having one seizure right after another. She had broken bones and damaged kidneys, and the doctor said if the head injuries didn't kill her, the, uh, uh, if the head injuries didn't kill her, probably her kidneys would. So when you look at me today, I'm not just telling you something that the Bible says. I'm telling you something I have learned to put the Bible, the Word of God, into action and come yeah. through. Well, my wife and I, you know, we went outside and went to a little chapel. And, of course, I, I'd been praying on the hours that I was on my flight and changing flights. And she was in total shock. So when I talk about unscheduled events, I know what I'm talking about. This was an unscheduled event. So we went outside and we took hands and we said, the word of God says, if any two shall agree, it's touching any one thing, it shall be done for them to glorify the Father which is in heaven. And we knew God didn't do this to her. But we knew God would in the, in the end get glory out of her healing. And she didn't die at the scene of the accident, so we believe God wanted her to live. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So... We began to pray, and we said, Lord, teach us. You know, uh, the Bible tells us in Psalms 25, verses 1 and 2, teach me, Lord, guide me, Lord, show me, Lord. So we said, Lord, show us how to walk through this victoriously. 
not to be afraid, not to be fearful, or let the negative reports cause us to give up. Because the doctor had said to me, even when I come in, she won't be alive when the sun comes up in the morning. And then this healing evangelist that I had thought was my friend come in at 4 o'clock in the morning. And he said, Don, God told me Tammy's going to die. Wow. Some kind of friend. Well, you know, in the Bible, Jesus had to put people out because of their unbelief. I said, thank you for coming. But... I believe it's time for you to go. <laughs> Seriously. I didn't want to hear any more of that because we were believing, Pastor Geneva, we were believing for the opposite. We were believing for healing. And here he comes in saying, God told him Tammy's going to die. I mean, I, I mean, you know, I don't know how I could bear that news to somebody, you know. Uh, but we, we just prayed and we just said, Lord, we just bind those words and believe that they have no power and they have no effect. You give her life and she didn't, she didn't go at the scene so she's going to live and not die. Well, you know, 11 days passed and it was 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning and uh, the neurosurgeon came in and, and we had made a lot of friends in the hospital, you know, because there was a lot of people in there with those head injuries and one of the doctors, his son, had had a motor motorcycle accident, had the same type of injuries, and wound up that he died actually the night that my daughter, that on the 11th morning, the, the night before his uh, son had actually died. And, uh, but we were, we were uh, 6.30 in the morning. She was not at the hospital. I'd stayed the night. And the newer surgeon come in, and he said, well, Reverend, he said, I just got to just come back from checking Tammy, and he said, I looked at her chart, and he said, I'm going to tell you she's not going to make it today. Uh, I know I told you the first day she wouldn't make it, but here it is now. She's just not going to go. I, I've checked her chart. It's, it's over because, you know, the other young man had just died, and, and um, it was a, another doctor, and it was his friend, too, and he called his name and says, just the same situation. He said, we've done all we can do. And, um, and they had given me an option earlier that they could do a surgery, head surgery, and they said it's 50-50 either way. I said, well, if it's 50-50 either way, why, why go in if it's only 50, and if it's 50 this way, I think I'll take my chances and believe for 100 uh, with not doing anything. <laughs> he said, okay, that's your choice. And anyway, that morning I looked at him and I said, he's a wonderful doctor too, he's a very good doctor. And I said, well, you know, doctor, I said, I know that's what you told me. But I said, my confidence, I said, you know, you've done a great job and I have no complaints about anything you've done. You've done everything you've known to do. And he said, I have. Reverend, I've done everything I know to do. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I'm not going to take your advice and, and leave the hospital and go take care of things that you've just told me to do. I'm going to stay here because I believe she's going to live and not die. He said, I said, I believe God is, is, has already healed her body, but it's just got to be manifested. And he said, well, I'll just be honest. There's nothing more I can do. And if anything is good, it's going to be, have to be God because I can't do it. So I went back in the waiting room and I sat down. There's 20 people in the waiting room and I put my hands in my face and I began to sing a song. I can't sing. <laughs> but who cares <laughs> when you get... Uh, news like I just got. Who cares that 20 people's there and you're singing a verse of a song that's a faith song because I needed it because my emotions were just, my emotions were just pulled in every direction and, and we'd been in the hospital 24 hours a day just going home to, to bathe and come right back and, and so uh, when my emotions were just at the point of, you know, God, this is, we've been here 11 days now. But I just sang that song, and I, when I did, you know, tears were streaming down my face, but I was singing in faith. And, uh, and you know, just a minute or two, the nurse came running out, and she said, Reverend Flowers, I want you to come back. I want you to, I want you to go back to Tammy's room. You know, we could only go back there 20 minutes each time, three times a day, and this wasn't one of those times. And so the doctor just had left with me this bad news that she's going to die any minute. And so I went back, and I was expecting to see Tammy up talking, but all she was doing was blinking her eyes. 
But you know what? I didn't let that phase me. I just knew, to me, that was a sign that we were moving in the right direction. And so I started praising God and glorifying God and praying in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> now, this nurse was standing beside me, and I was praying in the Holy Ghost. But see, you don't care. I mean, I, if nothing's wrong, I don't care for anybody hearing me praying in the Holy Ghost. It doesn't have to be something wrong for me to pray in the Holy Ghost. But I was just praying in the Holy Ghost, and that nurse said, <laughs> She said, I used to go to that church, and I used to have them tongues, too. <laughs> And I just slapped my hand on her head and I said, well, get them back in Jesus' name. She just started blurping out in tongues and crying and carrying on. I mean, it was loud too, you know. It's six something in the morning, you know. And there's another lady and a young woman in the bed next to her. And, and she had been there for weeks with mononucleosis. And, you know, she was just in a real bad state and couldn't. I mean, they were saying she was going to die. She said, I don't know what's going on over there, but it feels good. Bring it over here to my bed. So we went over there and, and I said, lay your hands on her. She said, oh, we're not supposed to do that. I said, who cares what you're not supposed to do? The Holy Ghost is in here. He's, this woman wants the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I want the Holy Ghost. I want the Holy Ghost. Everybody say, I want the Holy Ghost. I want more of the Holy Ghost. Come on, say, I want more of the Holy Ghost. Come on, help me out. I want more of the Holy Ghost. Help me out. Tell me. Help me out. I want more of the Holy Ghost. Hmm. I feel like in one of those meetings I could run around the room. My spirit just jumped out and ran around the room. You didn't even see it. Wow. Everyone say, I want more of the Holy Ghost. Oh, help me out here. Act like you mean it. I want more of the Holy Ghost. See, when you're passionate about something, you've got some emotion and expressions. And when you're passionate about something, you know, you know every emotion on the inside of you is being released. And you're pressing in like that little woman with an issue of blood. She pressed. She pressed. I want you to press this morning. If you are pressed this morning, the Holy Ghost will come on you and destroy every yoke of the enemy against you. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hmm. But she laid hands on that young woman. Yeah, that's it. Just let the Holy Ghost flow. I don't care. I'd rather be happy than sad any time. These people that don't believe in happiness and, and victory and laughter and joy in church, but they... Like they came to a funeral... I don't even go to funerals that way. I go to funerals with my head up, with my, high, my eyes wide open saying, these people are in heaven. This is something to rejoice about because that's all, we're all working to go there. I am. I don't know about you, but I didn't get in this thing to go to hell. I got in because God told me there was a heaven. I said, that's what I want. That's where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. So I don't know about you, but I'm in this thing to go to heaven. Now, I'm not asking for the bus to come right now. But if it were to come right now, I'd just go right on up. I don't know how long I've been preaching. I didn't do my timer. So somebody's going to have to hold up some fingers or something and start counting me down. That person back there on the camera, I guess they can't do that. But in my production, so somebody's always telling me 10, 5. So somebody's got to start counting me down. I don't even know how long I've been here. I don't even know when she gave me the service. I didn't even look. 
I just know what time it is now, and I'm having a good time. I'm anointed. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I wish y'all could see her face. Man, this is awesome. I mean, you, you just, your eyes and your, your mouth and your expressions, this is just, I mean, how could anybody think anything but good? Why would you want her to sit over here and bawl and squall and snot start coming out of her mouth and her looking ugly? Why would anybody want that to happen when she's sitting here? My goodness, this just makes you think that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Just, just, just let it, just let it, just fill you up. You know, just let it be poured all over you. I mean, when I, when the, sometimes I get in my prayer closet and the Holy Ghost comes down and, and I know I got schedules to meet and things, but you know, I just, I don't ever take my watch into the, into the prayer, prayer closet because I don't want it to bother me. I want to be at peace with the Lord. Amen. See, somebody prays like this. Just pray. Just pray. Amen. Well, you know, uh, the nurse and I came out of that room, and up the hall was the nurse's station. And I ran in there, and I just started out real loud. Tammy's blinking her eyes. I mean, I was yelling it out, you know. Oh, oh, oh Reverend, 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 it's early in the morning. This is intensive care unit. Calm down, calm down, calm down. I said, I'm calm. I'm just excited. Tammy's blinking her eyes. Well, I ran out of there, and our daughter was on the seventh floor. So I went out to the... Uh, waiting area where the elevators were and when I got on the elevator I punched every floor and when the door opened at every floor I yelled down the hall as loud as I could Tammy's blinking her eye <laughs> then I got down to the first floor and by this time it was right around 7 a.m. in the morning I got down to the first floor this is a huge hospital too by the way and so when I got down to the first floor I happened to remember it was the where the cafeteria was. I'd been in there a lot of times. And so I ran into the cafeteria and it was filled with doctors, nurses, and people. And I mean, it was just filled. And so I got me a chair and a glass and a knife and just started banging on that <laughs> to get everybody's attention. And I said, give me your attention. Well, it calmed down just like this because this weirdo coming in there jumping in the chair <laughs> telling everybody I got an announcement to make. And so I said, Tammy's blinking her eyes. I said it very loud. And I said, I want you to know again, Tammy's blinking her eyes. Well, most of them didn't know who Tammy was, and they didn't know who I was. And anyway, they thought I was some weirdo. Anyway, I jumped down and went down to the nurse's station on the first floor and told them Tammy's blinking her eyes. And, you know, I, I called everybody I knew to call and, and woke everybody up. And as soon as they'd answer the phone, I'd just say, uh, Tammy's blinking her eyes and hang up the phone. And uh, I, I, I was just praising God because something had changed, and I knew we were on our way. Everybody else, they said, that's nothing. That could happen to anybody that's in an unconscious state. They can blink their eyes. But it didn't matter to me what they said. Tammy was blinking her eyes. And so a couple of hours later, you know, I'd kind of uh, eased up a bit. And... Um, I walked into the cafeteria and was going to have some coffee and toast, and I was sitting down with my coffee and toast, and there was a big round table right behind me. It was doctors and nurses and 
One of them spoke up and said, did y'all hear the preacher this morning? He was really something. He was yelling everywhere about his daughter blinking her eyes. And don't the poor thing know that that doesn't mean anything? <laughs> don't the poor thing know that doesn't mean anything? <laughs> I took a big sip, then put my coffee cup down, turned my chair around. And after I turned my chair around, I stood up. I said, did you hear? <laughs> Tammy's blinking her eyes. <laughs> well, I could make a long story, but she's healed. She's whole. She's well. Her husband, her husband in the United States Army. He served in Iraq. He served in Iran. He served in the first Gulf War. And my 14-year-old grandson just played a great concert the Wednesday night on his viola. So I want you to know everything is well. Everything is well. See, what you've got to understand is if you're going to thrive and not just survive, your revelation has got to be greater than your environment. Everybody said, say this, I want my revelation, want my revelation to, be my to be greater than my environment. To be greater than any limitation. Now think on that and just meditate on that. See, the Word does not just come to us, but it's revealed to us. And when it's revealed to us, it becomes bigger than our unscheduled events. And see, that's what took my wife and I through this with our daughter. Because when she was dismissed from the hospital, she was dismissed as a vegetable. She could follow you with her eyes. She couldn't speak. She was paralyzed. And uh, they had set her broken bones, and her kidneys had cleared up. But the head injuries, they said, was a permanent uh, damage and that she would never be normal. But, you know, we didn't believe that report. Everybody say, the first report's not the last report. The first report's not the last report. And so we had our own report. We had our own report. We had our own report from the Word of God. Everybody say, I've got my report from the Word of God. See, you have to decide, do you believe the Bible or do you believe the circumstances more than you believe the Bible? See, I'm not telling you the circumstances are not real. I explained that early on on Romans 4, 17, call those things which be not. They're not. But call them as though they are. That's right. So I'm not denying that we have problems and unscheduled events and hurtful things that comes in our life. And you don't have to be committing sin or doing nothing wrong. Satan just really doesn't like you when you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. But the Holy Ghost will set you up to where you can overcome him. I mean... If he tells you you're not smart, just tell him to read the end of the book. <laughs> you're much smarter than he is. He got kicked out of heaven. He thought he was so smart, and he got kicked out of heaven. But you're the one that's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and going to heaven, and he's not. Yeah. And I'm amazed sometimes at believers, sometimes of how they get themselves in all the emotion, just like those 22 texts I got last night. It was emotion, emotion. Precious person, a precious person that say they believe the Word of God. But when unscheduled events come, what do you do? Do you let the over, you know, David said, I believe it's Psalm 61 and 2, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to that rock that is higher than higher. When my heart is overwhelmed, 
when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You know, when this lovely lady and I got married, we got married in Niagara Falls, Ontario, where she was born. She's an Italian, but she's Canadian Italian. Her parents came over from Italy, and I was preaching to her church, and that's where I met her. And uh, when we got married, on our first night, we stopped in Buffalo, New York, after our wedding. And we had a hotel in Buffalo, New just out of Buffalo, New York. And the uh, first thing we did when we got into the room, we went over beside the bed and knelt down. We took hands and began to pray. We made a vow to each other. We're going to always love God. We're going to always love God, no matter what happens in our life. We didn't know what our future was going to be. I hadn't been all over the world. I'd never been out of the country except to Canada at the time. I didn't know I'd go to all the nations of the world and do conferences all over the world. And I, I just didn't know any of that. I believed it in my heart. And I had confessed it that it would happen. But I didn't know how it was all going to play out. But here was two people that had nothing, no influence, very little influence. I've been preaching in churches, but, you know, I was just young and didn't have the, the seasoning that I have now. You know, you can have experience, but experience don't necessarily set you up. When you're seasoned with experience, it helps. But I wasn't experienced or seasoned either one at the time. I was only 19 years old. But we knelt down beside our bed and we took hands and we began to pray. We'll always love God. We made that vow. We'll always love each other. And we'll always be a tither and a giver. Thank you for sharing this morning, Pastor Geneva, about giving and tithing. And you know, if you don't tithe, if you hadn't learned, remember, your revelation must be greater than your environment or your limitation. So if you don't tithe, I'm not shooting you, I'm loving you. Tithing is for your benefit. Right. You, want, you, you know something? If you don't tithe, you're not going to change heaven one bit. The heaven's already like it's going to be. God doesn't need one penny you have to change heaven. Isn't that amazing? amazing? I had some people one time tell me they was going to withhold their tithe from our ministry because they didn't like a decision I made. <laughs> I said, well, if you think that's going to change me, you just keep holding it because... <laughs> The decision's made. It was the right decision. You may not agree with it, but the decision's made. So you just hold your ties. You're not going to hurt me. I'm still going to be going 20 years from now, 30 years from now. And, and you're going to have problems because you're trying to do something to me or to God by holding your ties. You can't change God. <laughs> God is God. Come on, everybody help me out here with this kind of voice. God is God. Come on. One more time. Y'all are so good. <laughs> How come we didn't know each other before? You know, somebody told me I went one place to preach one time. They said, we never heard of you. And I said, I've never heard of you either. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether we heard of each other or not. We're connected in the spirit. Yeah. Amen. Let's do it good. Hey, Amen. So if you don't tithe, you're not, you're not hindering God. You're hindering yourself. God's saying, I can't bless you. I can't open the windows of heaven on you. I'll, my, my windows are open. I'm in the blessing. I don't need anything. I got everything I need. You're the one that needs my blessings. You're the one that needs my help. 
My lightning fast mind got that one time. <laughs> that I'm the one in need. That God is the one that made me. So if God made me, I realize there's something bigger than me. But he doesn't need what I have, but I need what he has. And the only way I can get that is by obeying him. And when I obey him, then God begins to bring things to me. Now I'm going to try to start winding this down if I can, I, even though I didn't preach my message. Is that all right? Maybe somebody might be getting a little hungry or something. I don't know. But we made that commitment. We made that commitment. You know what? We never have ever changed it. But my wife was expecting our second child. And we were preaching in a little church in San Antonio, Texas. And um, we ran out of money. And I guess the church didn't have any because they wasn't giving us any money. <laughs> and I didn't come here to get no money. I mean, you know, I'll, if you want to give me some, I'll take it. <laughs> We were staying in a, 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 a motel that, you know, it, it was really, you wouldn't want to stay there, let me put it that way. <laughs> and that's all we could afford at the time. And, um, and we, we ran out of money. The church, as I said, didn't, wasn't giving any. I don't even remember why, and I wasn't about to go to the pastor and say, hey, could you give us a little advance on what you're going to do here in the offerings? No, I mean, I just learned better. My mentor was a man that taught me faith. And so I knew, I was young, but I knew better than to go asking anybody for help or mooch faith and getting around the members. Boy, we're believing God for one just like you got, a tie just like you got on, man. Man, I like them shoes. We're believing God for some just like them. You know what that is? That's mooch faith. Mooch faith. Boy, I wish my wife had a pair of earrings like that. I'm believing for my wife to get a pair of earrings just like that. I want you to pray that the Lord would just, just give my wife a pair. Now, don't you dare go over there and give them to her now, because I'm just kidding. But see, that's mooch faith. So I wasn't going to mooch faith nobody. I believe God. But here she was expecting the second child, and we had the first one with us, and we are all getting kind of hungry, to tell you the truth. And so... She looked through her purse, see if we could find any money. She didn't have any stash back. So I looked, and finally I found a big, for, for back then this was a lot of money, I found a $100 bill folded up. That was a lot of money back then. What's your name? Nicolette. Nicolette. Well, Nicolette, you can sit on the front row anywhere we got. <laughs> if, if everybody, we'll just take her with us, because I like her smile. But I pulled that $100 bill out. I thought we'd died. I'd died and gone to heaven when I found that money. But I remembered just about the time I got it, it was time that I had not sent in. Somebody said, well, you could have borrowed it. I could have done a lot of things. God wouldn't have struck me dead. God wouldn't have cursed me or got mad at me. But we made a promise to each other and to God. So I happened to look, and I had on a, a decent watch. It wasn't kind of have on today, but it's a decent watch. And I said to her, I said, I'm going to go down and pawn this watch and get us some money. And the first thing I'm going to do is get a stamp and a money order and mail the tie. I'll get rid of it. I've been carrying it around. <laughs> Didn't know this. And then I'll get us some food, and then we'll save some to give to the church tonight. So as I was walking, not that I was going to get that much, but she, I was going out the door, and she said, take mine, too. So I had both watches. I went down to the pawn shop, and I pawned our watches, and I got a little bit of money. Then I went over to the post office, got a money order for the $100 and a stamp and an envelope, and sent it off. And, boy, I just felt like, whoo, this feels good now. Went back, bought some food, and bought some gas, and gave some in the church that night. Well, you know what? 
I didn't see the windows of heaven open and just money start pouring in everywhere. I mean, it was still just kind of, and I don't recall a big offering when we left. I think we just got enough gas money to get to our next place. Not complaining, just explaining. Did you get it? <clears throat> and so we went on, and of course the ministry began to grow. And, and you know what happened, though? God never really just came and somebody gave me bunches of money or anything like that. But you know, everywhere we started going, I didn't tell the story now. I wouldn't go around telling what we did because I didn't want anybody to know we was that broke. But everywhere we'd go, somebody would come up and say, oh, I just want to give you a nice watch to my wife or to me. Was just giving us watches everywhere. <laughs> and then I had all these watches, so we started giving watches away. And the more watches we gave away, the more watches it would come. And I remember I was in Atlanta, Georgia a number of years ago, and I was about to go on stage. We had about 3,000 people there that night, and I was just about to go on. No, I was coming off the stage. I'm sorry. And this guy met me, and he said, I, got a, I, I own a jewelry store, and I want to give you a watch. I said, I don't need a watch. I'm in a hurry. I have to go. And I was nice to the gentleman. He said, I have to give you a watch. I said, okay. Thank you. Bless you. Leave me a card or something with your name. So he said, that's not important. I just had to give you this watch. Well, I left, don't even, to this day, I don't know the man's name, I don't know his jewelry store, I don't know anything. So one day my other watch, I gave it away or something, I pulled that out of the drawer and started wearing it. And I did something to the band, so I got the pliers and tried to fix it. And I made it worse. So one day I stopped by the jewelry store, a friend of mine, and I said, can you fix this? He said, no, we have to send this into the company. I thought, oh, one of them time. So he told me where to send it. So I sent it in, and I got a call, and they said, from the, jewelry, from the watch place, they said, are you um, Don Clowers? I said, yes. And they said, we have your watch here, and you didn't insure it. And I said, why? Why should I insure it? They said, do you know what that watch is worth? I said, no, maybe $100, $150, maybe. Did you know the band is 18 karat gold? <laughs> no. Did you know? Did you know? Did you know? No. Well, that then, this was a long time ago, then it was a $3,500 watch, and I was working on it with my wire plier. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my point I want you to know is, if you're afraid to tithe, if you're afraid to tithe and to give, you must get a revelation of tithing, and it's got to be bigger than your limitations. See, my wife and I wasn't afraid. Well, I was in Singapore not long ago, and it was my birthday, and um, we was in this big high-rise hotel with a friend of mine in Singapore, and uh, I didn't tell anybody it was my birthday. I mean, you know, it's January the 25th if you're interested. <laughs> But I, I didn't tell anybody it was my birthday. I mean, you know, I was just, I was just, I was in, on a mission. I was traveling. We stopped to preach there in Singapore, and we were on our way to India to do a conference there. And, and so um, we was in this high rise, and this friend of mine, you know, a little while after we had our dinner, they brought a big cake out, and it said, happy birthday. And I said, how did you know it was my birthday? He said, I know a lot more about you than you know about me. I said, hmm, well, that's good, I guess. And so we were enjoying the cake, and a little while later they had somebody bring a box out and open the box, and it happened to be this watch. It's not a Timex either. It's, it's got a different, it, it, it has an R at the front instead of a T. <laughs> but you know, this just happens to me all the time, my wife all the time. But it all started because we didn't take money that we needed for our needs, we put God first. And I continue to give away watches. We continue. But my wife right now has, she chooses in me which watch we want to wear today. Somebody said, well, that's silly. Well, talk to God about it if you think that's silly. <laughs> that's good. Amen? Amen? So I want to tell you, God is your source. Yes. 
So if you're frightened to tithe or you look at what you have and say, it's just not enough. I don't see how we can do this. God won't care. God won't get mad. He's not going to get mad at you. He's not going to zap you. <laughs> but he's not going to open the windows of heaven on you either because you're keeping what is his. See, I didn't have this in my notes to talk about this, but you told me to preach. <laughs> If you put God first, can I tell you one more story before? You know, when you, when you live life the way we've lived it, trusting God, and God just opening doors, it is just absolutely, is absolutely unthinkable about a good God. When our daughter was in the hospital, I wasn't doing ministry because we were, I was just really right there at the bedside every 20 minutes to be able to go back there. But I don't know, somewhere in there, the money got really slim and we just had a little bit of money and there was a guy that his daughter had been hit by a car too and she was in a cast. She didn't have the head injuries but she had other injuries still in intensive care. She was in a cast from her waist down and then other things. And they had five children and another one on the way. And he smoked constantly. If you smoke, I'm not crushing nobody. I'm just telling you what he did. And he just smoked constantly. And every word, every other word or more was curse words. So I just nicknamed him Cusser. <laughs> And so I said, Custer, what you going to cuss about today? <laughs> and I tell him, man, don't cuss so much. Why do you cuss so much, you know? But I, I did. I shouldn't have called him Custer, but that's what he was doing, so I called him. So I'd been home to shower, and on the way I heard the Lord say, give Custer all your money. Did God say, did God call him Custer? No. <laughs> so... But I didn't even at the time know his real name. <laughs> Only the name I would given him, you know. And so that's the impression that came to me to give him all my money. And so I was just mad because I was thinking, I'm going to buy him cigarettes, and I don't really want to buy his cigarettes. And um, if you smoke, don't get offended at me. Just go ahead and die. <laughs> Anyway, I was arguing back and forth with the Lord about, you know, giving him this money. And so I parked and someone went, I walked in and who did I see? Right. He walked in just, just I mean, we we're walking in the, in the door and we just come face to face. I said, Cusser. <laughs> he said, yeah, what is it, preacher? I said... The Lord told me to give you this money. He said, what? I said, yeah, the Lord told me to give you this money. He was so hard. He had been so, I'd never seen him have a soft side to him, but he just fell to his knees. And he said, preacher, I want to know this Jesus that you're talking about. <laughs> He said, you don't have any money either, and I know this must be your last, and for you to give it to me. And he said, nobody's ever given me anything. And in my mind, I'm thinking, and I know why. <laughs> God had to talk to somebody like me to give it away to you because I didn't want to give it to you either. <laughs> but my heart was right after a while. And I released that money. And when I released that money into Custer's hands and he fell down on his knees and big tears started streaming down his face. And right there in that waiting room, he made Jesus Lord and Savior of his life. 
God just touched him and changed him and, and we hugged and embraced, you know, and prayed and, I mean, it was just, it was an awesome, awesome time. And other people was around, but you know, I really don't give a rip when people are around and see me doing something like that, you know, because if people can cuss out loud and say nasty stuff in front of you, why can't I say something good in front of you? Amen. And we were embracing, and I just, I never thought I'd be hugging cusser. <laughs> but we're both crying, and you know, the presence of the Lord was there, and, and God actually touched some other people around the room. And after a few minutes, he said, you know, preacher, he said, we ran out of money a couple of uh, days ago, and I guess you've noticed I hadn't been smoking the last couple of days. I said, well, not really. <laughs> and he said, my wife hadn't had any food except what's left on the plate of my daughter when they bring her food. That's the only food she's had. And boy, don't that make you feel good to know that you obey God. Yeah. And you know what? That miraculously changed his life because our vow we made when we were kids we'll love God, we'll love each other, we'll always be a tither and a giver. And it makes no difference where we are, what happens, what our finances may be, we give first, we tithe first. Now, Unscheduled events still come, but when they come, instead of us surviving, God helps us to thrive through the unscheduled events. Some way and somehow, we always come out. You'll always come out if you can learn. Now, there's a secret that I told you twice. Some of you wrote it down, but there's a secret that I told you twice. Your revelation must be larger or bigger than your environment or your limitation. And when you pray for God to give you that revelation and say, God gave my wife and me a, a revelation of tithing and giving and loving, loving, number one. God gave us, a, 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 and I'm telling you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything from the beginning because we made the right choice. And I just, I just don't want you to think I'm talking down to you about tithing and giving. If you don't, I want you to know that I want to help you open up and see you can't change God. You can't rob heaven. Heaven is okay. It's you that needs what heaven's got. And the only way you can get what heaven's got is by you doing your part. Amen. Amen. Anybody get anything out of this today? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I, I feel compelled to tell you one more thing. Is it all right? Well, I'm used to preaching a lot of those places where they give me 23 minutes. <laughs> so I feel like I'm in a candy store today. <laughs> I actually do. I don't know what it's doing to your back end, but you okay? Yeah. They tell me your mind can take as only as much as your bottom can endure, so... <laughs> I forgot what I was going to tell you. <laughs> God is good, isn't he? Yes. You know, you, you sometimes look, I, I really didn't forget. You sometimes look at where you come from or what's happened to you. And many people live their life out of what happened rather than allowing that for the Holy Ghost to get in it and change you. Now, I know a woman 
that was abused by her husband very badly. And um, it really injured her life. But one day she turned her life over to Jesus and give her heart to God and actually became in the, become a minister of the gospel. She had a brother born by the same parents. And he had a few things happen to him when he was in Vietnam. He wasn't injured, but he just took too much drugs and he injured himself. But when he come back, he blamed everybody for their problems. But this lady, instead of blaming anybody for her problems, she got God to heal her of her problems. She asked God to heal her. But the brother just kept blaming and blaming and blaming and blaming and blaming. Got married and, and then divorced and never took care of his child. But he blamed for that. See, blaming gets you nowhere. When something happens, it needs to be repaired. It needs to be fixed. It might have been somebody's fault, but blaming them doesn't. See, the lady that hit our daughter, she didn't mean to do that. I could have been mad at her forever, but it would have still happened. See, I'm amazed at people that get stuck in an unscheduled event or in something that happened. Well, this woman decided that she's going to take God and his word to get through. Well, anyway, as time went on, he got worse and worse. And one day, he called his sister and he said, I really want to give my heart to God. I know what I should do. He said, you're the one that's had everything bad to happen to you, and really nothing's happened to me. I want to give my heart to God. So they sent money and had him brought home and let him live with him. And, and he did good for a couple of years. But one day she called me up and she said, Donnie's not doing good. Can I send him down to you? And <clears throat> because I told her, I said, one day he has to really choose when things start happening. Did he make that choice because of you? Or did he make the choice because he wanted to make the choice? <clears throat> I'm talking to you. See, you don't make the choice because some emotion hits you. You decide. I decided over 51 years ago that I love this woman and I've never changed my mind. Now sometimes I've wanted to. Sometimes she's wanted to. Now does that surprise you? It shouldn't. But I didn't change my mind when she starts telling me what to do and where to park. <laughs> What to wear, what not to wear, that looks good, that don't look good, you know? I mean, she can really tell you what to do, trust me. No, it's this way. No, it's that way. You're going the wrong way. Turn the car around. No, we take, you know, in airports, on and on and on, you know? I could sometimes want to change my mind. We never changed our mind. But I told her, I said, one day he's going to have to decide... Because he's lived this other life, now he's been in this life, and it's been like a cocoon because of the way you live and his environment and his atmosphere. But one day he's going to wake up and say, do I really believe this? Will that happen? She sent him to me, and he stayed a week with me. I couldn't help him. He went back, kept blaming and kept blaming and kept blaming and kept blaming. Well, just a few years ago, he was found dead in a place in L.A., just out of L.A. And she's gone on. Two people came from the same place. One made the right choice. One made the wrong choice. So your environment, let your revelation be greater and always choose the right thing and never get stuck. See, I know this young man that he watched his father shoot his mother on Christmas Day. He never celebrated Christmas for years and years and years. And everything he did, he lived through that moment. 
He was angry at people. He was angry at employers. He was angry at this and angry at that because he lived through that moment. And I said, how long? He said, you don't know how that hurt. I said, I don't have a clue. I said, man, I can't, I can't identify with your pain because it's probably more than I could even picture. But that happened years ago. You're past that now. Somehow let God heal your pain. Let God take your pain. Cast your care on Him. Let God take your pain. And if God takes your pain, then you don't have to deny every Christmas. You don't have to be angry at everybody. It's not everybody's fault that something's happening to you. You know, I got him to see. I got him to see that he was the one missing out on Christmas, the birth of Jesus, all of the festivities and things that happens at Christmas. Whether you celebrate it or not, that's your business. But I'm just telling you, he was not doing it. He was doing it because a moment in time, see, a moment in time can destroy your life. Or you can take that moment in time and bathe it in the Holy Ghost and bathe it with the Word of God. Wash it with the water of the Word. And as you wash it with the water of the Word, you'll come out better than you've ever been. I just gave you an example of two people. And one of them today is, is, uh, has the largest television ministry of anybody in the world today in a Christian service that's going on for God. But the brother chose to blame everybody for his problems. When the sister was abused by her father and one day said, I forgive you, Dad, for what you've done and left it behind. That didn't exempt him for the wrong he did, but it exempted her and made her free to where she could walk with God. Oh. Would you bow your head with me right now? I tell you what, if, you, if, you're, if you're caught in an unscheduled situation right now and you want healing, I want you to just stand on your feet right now. If you're in an unscheduled situation right now and you want healing and you want God's wisdom to come through this, don't be ashamed. Just stand up real quick. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about what anybody thinks. That's it. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you for standing. Bless you for standing. See, we're going to call those things that's not as though they were. Come on, just keep standing right now. You that's got the unscheduled events that you're going through and something there that is just really, that's it. Bless you. Come on, we're going to pray and we're going to believe God. You that, you that want this prayer, let's believe God right now. Let's believe God right now because the Holy Ghost is in this room. Before I left my room this morning, I said, God, I want to add value through the Holy Ghost to every person that's there. If there's anybody else, don't be ashamed. Stand on your feet right now. And if you've been hurt, you're going through something, something's happened to you, there's a moment in time in your life that it seems to, to flare up on you from time to time and you, you don't want it there, right now is the chance. Right now is your opportunity for the Holy Ghost to set you free. I want everybody else to stand on your feet with them right now, and we're going to believe God. We're going to believe God that healing's going to flow. Tonight, I'm going to lay hands on people. That be all right? Amen. To lay hands on people tonight? I hope you come back tonight. If I don't, just lock the door, and I'll keep you here till 6 o'clock. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Is it Nicolette? I believe God's going to help you today, Nicolette. You just didn't. I, you may sit here on the front row all the time. I don't know. But th this today... Is, is not just a, a, a coincidence. This is your day. 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 Come on. Come on. Whoa. Whoa. Put your hands up right now. The Holy Ghost is in this room. Ramana, Ramana, yeah, yeah, come on, come on. 
Everybody believe God. The anointing of God's in this room right now. The anointing of God's in this room right now. Brahma Nesiki. Kriti Biam Sula Bara Bahasata. Brahma Noka Bara Badaisiki. Kata the Brahma Nesi Libidi Sabaran Rada Bosata. Brahma Namanda Bakata. Harabata. You know, about 30 minutes ago, about 30 minutes ago, the Holy Ghost just had me look over at you and I just started speaking in, in under, under my, my, in my thoughts. That the Holy Ghost, I didn't know you were going to stand up, but the Holy Ghost, just let me look right through you in the Spirit. And today, today, you have, your faith has touched God. You're going to go out of this room different than you come in here. Brande labata, ho labata, rabarama nama, brige rabarebe, kasabarabarabada. Come on, and release your faith right now. Something's happening in the Spirit. Something's happening in the Spirit to you right now. Oh, bless you. <laughs> oh, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, everybody just pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Brahma Neke. Breda da Bahasa. Ha 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 yeah. In the name of Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yeah, all over you. All over you. From the top of your head to the soles of your feet. From the top of your head to the soles of your feet. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Ah, oh, yeah, in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Whoa. I feel the I feel a wave of the Holy Ghost. I feel a wave of the Holy Ghost. Just take it right now. Take it right now. Take it right now. Take it right now. Take it. Take it in Jesus' name. Take it in Jesus' name. God's healing you. God's healing you. God's delivering you. God's setting you free. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost a little bit more. Just pray in the Holy Ghost a little bit more. Just pray in the Holy Ghost a little bit more. Pray in the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, come on, let it start flowing. Let the Holy Ghost start flowing. Let the Holy Ghost. Come on, let the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 Oh, Rabba Daba Sata Brahmana, take a Rabba Daba Yabra. Bribe de Baramana Mahatata. Rabba Daba Sata. Rabba Daba Ramana Mamsata Daba. Yea, Rabba Ramana Mahatata. Rabba Sata Yabba Rabba Daba Maya Yayoko. Come on, some more, some more. Come on, let the Holy Ghost flow through you. Give way to the Holy Ghost. Let that river, let the river of God just flow through you. Let the river of God flow through you right now. Thank you, Lord. 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 Every one of you that stood up earlier, you're the first to stand up. And before I invited the congregation to stand together, I just know, I know in Jesus' name something's happening to you. And throughout the day, your life is changing. Your life is changing. Your life is changing. Your life is changing. Well, bless you. Bless you. You may be seated if you can. I'll be back here at 6 o'clock whether you will or not. <laughs>